Welcome to the Porsche Club Insider, your one stop for all things Porsche and PCA. Here's your host, Vu Gwyn, and the Insider Crew. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 36. I'm here with Manny Albin, Damon Lowney, and of course, we have Robert Forsyth at the helm on the computers and video. Robert, you want to um, throw that little uh, Instagram reel up? Buy a sports car, they said. It'll be fun, they said. You know what? They were right. That was. Uh, that's actually become very popular on Instagram. Uh, the uh, RWB that was at SEMA. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, for those of you that are just listening, we just threw up the reel from PCA's Instagram. It's a uh, RWB993. If you haven't checked out our Instagram page, I encourage you to do so. We're making some big moves there and um, some cool footage and uh, some insider stuff that uh, you'll definitely want to take a look at, uh, as well as the Porsche Club Insider Instagram page. Um, All right, man, we gotta, be, we're going to be, yeah, I was going to say, it's a busy show with, uh, with a lot of Porsche news and uh, a lot of photos and discussion about our uh, adventures at SEMA. Adventures at SEMA. We've been in a lot of planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, so, and there's also lots of Porsche news. Yep. All right. So, where do we, where do we want to start? Let's uh, start with SEMA. Man, what uh, what 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 was to be expected? I guess for those right? who don't who don't know, uh, SEMA is the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association. Association. Yep. Which is, uh, I guess, essentially aftermarket. Um, you don't. You have some of uh, some manufacturers. I think. Ford and Toyota had displays, but uh, this Dodge. Isn't, it was Dodge and Toyota. This Dodge was Ford, yeah. Ford was not there this year. You can tell they all look the same at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so SEMA is actually a B two B conference. It's not really open to consumers. It's uh, manufacturers and distributors go there and try to, you know, show their wares and services to companies that will take it to the local level. And there's also lots of education. There's lots of um, legislative work as well to making sure that the, the car culture, car customization, you know, is still alive and well in our in our uh, world. To say this place, this event is huge is an understatement. Um, in fact, we never made it to the, uh, the last. We did. No, I'm talking about the one that you call Tent City. Oh, uh, well, they didn't, they didn't have Tent City this year because they moved everything. Uh, they built they built a, a West Hall. Uh, so if you haven't been to Las Vegas in a while, the convention center was already large. But uh, during COVID, they popped up a whole West Hall that makes it even larger. And um, it, it's, it's open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, Friday is like the public day. Um, and you really have to hustle to be able to see everything. And then if you stop to have like a two minute conversation with, you know, a booth that puts you behind, I mean, we're talking about 15 to 20,000 steps a day, but it is really cool to see what's going on in the aftermarket world. And, you know, for, for us at PCA, it's a great way to see a number of our partners and sponsors under one roof. And by the way, Porsche is still, you know, a very strong mark that's represented at SEMA with some pretty cool cars. Yeah, it's it, it's uh, broken into. I always uh, I told some people that you know I had gone to see them and they're like, oh, that's a bucket list. I would love to get into that event. And I said, um, you know, I've been to several of them, and it's uh, it's exciting. It's a great seeing some of these new builds and some of this new stuff. But a lot of the stuff seems to be repetitive. Yeah, um, I, I would say this year, um, you know, last year was was very light because they didn't allow for uh, international businesses, you know, to, to be able to fly in. And, and there was still, you know, the, the COVID concern. So last year they held it. People were happy that people went. Um, it was definitely not as um, as populated, but I think a lot more business was conducted last year. This year, more more exhibitors and such more of a crowd but still not pre-covid numbers it still seemed kind of light so we went with our advertising uh director panorama advertising director uh ilko who was on the uh, podcast a few podcasts ago and uh obviously he goes there to uh seek out new business uh to meet up with current business uh you know to tell people what's new in pca uh, he carries around a little roller suitcase with the uh, panoramas inside of it and what was 
I thought was cool was uh, when we first went here like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. This was our 10th SEMA. Yeah, uh, yeah, not not my 10th, but I, I went the first time you and I went. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to explain to everyone who PCA was. Mm. A lot of them weren't familiar with PCA and its reach. Uh, this time around, all you had to say was PCA or Porsche Club of America, and immediately they said, oh, yeah, I'm very familiar with uh, PCA, and they knew about Unstock. Yes. Because the car, people had cars that were Unstock worthy. Uh, we mentioned to them about the show, and they were very much aware of uh of the show, I haven't seen uh, social media from the last year's show. Yeah, and in fact, uh, that's where Unstock came from. I think we've told the story before. You know, we we would go to see and see, see all these incredibly modified Porsches, and after the show, they kind of disappear and go back to wherever they came from. Um, but but this year, and the reason for Unstock is now um, the the general public will be able to see a lot of these cars as they will be coming to Burbank on November 13th, which by the time you listen to this podcast, it will have already happened. But uh, we're looking forward to hosting a number of these wild and crazy builds. And what's great is, you know, it it may not be your particular taste to have a wild and crazy version of a Porsche, but the passion is all the same. The amount of, um, you know, effort it takes for these people to build this car. Like I remember, I don't know if I have a photo of it, but there's this blue and yellow um, 911, I think it was a 991, if I'm not mistaken, uh, with the uh, Subaru engine in it. Uh, I think Road and Track actually did a full article on it. Yeah. So, so you, you you might not feel whatever about putting a non Porsche engine in it, but talking to the the builder, this car was left for dead. It was like a car that was just a chassis, and they thought, you know, how cool would it be to put, you know, a, a lightweight? It's still a boxer engine. Um, and you know with lots of power and see if they can make it work and you know it's a it's an engineering marvel that they did that and then when it came to like the paint scheme it wasn't just simply you know they threw on something they thought about it they thought about how you know the way the stripes were were kind of like an homage to a 917 but then they blended the it Salzburg in car. the Salzburg car and they blended it in with the Subaru rally stripes and they're true true Porsche diehards um, and uh, yeah I mean what they're doing might be controversial but like I said the passion is all the same and and they were really appreciative that we took the time to learn about the car and some of these cars will go through maybe uh, maybe we will uh, we have to go through it kind of quick because some people won't be seeing these cars so we'll we'll try to describe it the best well, that we can how we describe it like you're describing to a blind person <laughs> okay let's let's see if we can do this so throw up a couple cars um, this one here is actually a wrapped Panamera. There, and there's a whole wing. The, the West Hall has, I would say, a third of the West Hall just is full of different manufacturers of different types of vinyls. So the key thing here is to know that vinyl wrapping your car is a 3.5 or so mil color change, but it's not really it's protection. Not, not protection. It's not paint protection. When you talk about a vinyl or paint protection, you're talking about something that's about eight to nine mils so um the 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 beauty about the thinner vinyls is you know they can do all sorts of colors it's uh easier to wrap they can actually print on them around the contour edges Mm -hmm. it's uh it's a it's a lot more forgiving than trying to shoulder technology yeah trying to wrap but but we also saw that paint protection film we saw a little bit of it last year but paint protection film now be even though being at eight to nine mils they're starting to venture into some pretty cool colors yeah, and it's uh, otherwise what you're looking at for a wrap is you, you have to get uh, PPF paint protection film put on top of the wrap if you want the wrap to last. Yeah. So factor that into the price. It's not right. uh, not an inexpensive venture when people say, oh, oh just uh, wrap it. Uh, it's not a big deal. Well, investment wise, it can be a big deal. Yeah. And so Manny had probably the recurring question for every vinyl and PPF manufacturer there is like, when's a good time to take the vinyl or the PPF off your car. And I, and I got the feeling this was a question they had never been asked before <laughs> because they immediately would go to the warranty. The warranty. And they little. said, well, our warranty. I was like, well, I'm not asking about warranty. I'm saying, I explained to them, I said, listen, we have members that are buying cars pre-owned. And, you know, originally when the car was new, the owner had put PPF on it. So now the car is 10 years old, maybe 12 years old, and it still has that original PPF. It doesn't last forever, and you know from what I've heard, uh, the longer it stays on, the more expensive it is to remove and maybe even damage the paint. 
So what's your recommendations? And I, I, we almost stumped them yeah. as to uh, really how long, I guess they, so somebody said, you know, it's a really good question. We never thought of it. I said, well, to me, it's like uh, revenue looking at yourself in the face because you have a car that, um, you know, people bought, they want to keep as new and uh, they just have to be educated that PPF is not a forever thing and you have to uh, replace it at some point. Yeah, and the technology of vinyl and PPF has changed dramatically over the last decade. So, you know, it, it, when you think of a 10 year old Porsche, that's not very old, but the vinyl that might have been installed at the dealer or whomever back then, the adhesives, the vinyl composition itself is very different from the vinyls today. And they were talking about how the vinyls today, even if you go five, six, seven, eight years with today's vinyl, when you have a professional heat it up and remove it, it'll still more than likely come out, come off the car as one piece, leaving very little residue on the car, which that's, that's what is going to be expensive to having your paint protection removed. But for those of you that have the older films, um, it may look good, maybe because the car has been garaged or whatever. But at some point, you know, the glue and the film itself will be very difficult to remove. And that's where you can be paying money for uh, for people to to take it off. Yeah, I remember watching um, a channel called Ammo NYC and the uh, presenter on that channel, Larry Cosilla. Um, I highly recommend going to that channel. You learn a lot about what it takes to clean and detail a car. But there was one episode where he was removing uh, a paint protection film, and I believe it was on a Porsche. And I think there was a mix of a lot of hot water mm -hmm. to soften up that that goo and possibly a heat gun. And you know, it's just working away with the with the heat of the water or the heat gun and slowly pulling that off. And I can only imagine, you know, if there was no heat. And um, it was just old PPF that it would rip off the paint. It almost looked my boxer was so. nine years old, and oh my god, yeah. I was so happy. It was only half a uh, half a hood, not yeah. the full hood. It just, it came out little like pieces at a time, and it took forever to because uh, my race car used to have vinyl graphics, and every year I would take them off, you know, clean the paint, and then reapply uh, different graphics the following year. The uh, heat gun and it came right off. Yeah, because they were only a, a couple months old. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, but so not too much heat, right? <laughs> this, was, this was a hair dryer. So back in the days okay. when I had hair, I actually had, had a hair dryer. So now it serves a different purpose. <laughs> now, the, now the hair dryer permanently resides yeah. in the garage. <laughs> but yeah, so anyways, yeah, there was an entire, um, I don't know how many rows of a football field long, mm -hmm. at least. Yep. Uh, and up and down these rows uh, of um, uh, ceramics and uh, paint protection film. Yeah, so so along the same lines with with vinyl and such uh, in the West Hall, ceramics was definitely I mean at least two dozen different types of ceramic manufacturers, and I think what's interesting and don't quote me on this, but I believe most ceramics come from like South Korea or something like that, mm. and um, the, you know the different manufacturers. Like I said, don't quote me, but there might be some other countries where ceramics is made. But for, for a lot of these ceramic um, companies, they're, they're buying it from South Korea. And of course, they're they're formulating their own recipe. Um, and there's different like cure times. And what I was happy to see was there's a there's a number of companies. Yes, you have the pro level ceramics that lasts you know, six years and you have to have someone you know, do a paint correction on your car and apply it and let it sit for 24 hours. And that's probably the ultimate protection. But what was cool to see this time around going through SEMA is there's a number of companies that are coming out with ceramic products that are consumer friendly, but not like not just your regular spray on bottle that says it's ceramic, but it's actually truly a ceramic and it's applied the same way the professionals do it but the way it flashes or hardens and the time in which it cures is a little bit more forgiving for someone that might be uh, an amateur but better than your just average Joe um, th there is a ceramic solution for that so I'm kind of looking forward to, to maybe playing around in that area so I asked uh, also I asked the uh, manufacturers and vendors there how do you remove ceramic mm -hmm. and uh, it, so the long and short of it you got to ask each individual manufacturer because it varies. Uh, one of them said polish. Yep. Uh, uh, good polishing will take it off. Other one said uh, only wet sanding can take it off. Mm. 
which involves a body shop and someone knows who knows what you're doing. So, yeah. um, and we did find out that uh, putting ceramic on a matte finish. Yeah, uh, if, uh, <laughs> if you're considering doing that, make sure you talk to a professional yes. because I hear or we hear that there's, you know, uh, some things to consider when you're doing a ceramic coat on a matte finish. So there's a little tip for you. So I just want to bury my head in the sand, not do any of this and uh, say I'm going for that. Uh, was it patina or patina look? <laughs> patina. <laughs> patina. See, see, that's that's my you're goal with my portion. Though. Well, your car is naturally going into a matte finish because yeah, you don't all the dust. <laughs> <laughs> we had a text thread going on about uh, with uh, Paul Gentili, who's uh, we're going to do a one mile review on his Macan today, and he said he has just washed it and tried a new towel or something like that. Yeah, and I said, yeah, I use a similar towel on my Z3, and I. Uh, Something about the washing, and I had told Damon that I wash my Z Z3, my daily driver, once a week, and he was in shock that I wash this car once a week. Yeah, I I am and and was. <laughs> I wash my it. Porsche maybe two or three times, you know, during spring, summer, fall, <laughs> and then my Golf, you know, like three oh, to, I, si three I, to I six know months. How rarely you wash a car, I can tell. <laughs> And it's yeah. not because we're in a drought situation here on the East Coast. Quite the opposite, in no. fact. Who wants to go wash uh, the, the car when they, they get home? <laughs> not me. The cars get dirty. <laughs> it's very therapeutic. You know, okay. as, as long as you're happy, Damon, that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah. That's and, what I think. And if it's therapeutic for you, Manny, that's good for you. And yeah. Oh, you wash. You, you're worse than me. You have a uh, oh, yeah. water softener, so yes, I, your hands don't get uh, <laughs> wrinkly and everything. It's all about efficiency. <laughs> yeah. But when, when Paul was texting, he's like, have you guys ever used this product? And I think it was a Griot's product. It's and one of the big towels. The, yeah. The huge my towels. answer is I don't actually dry my car off. I let it air dry. And if there happen to be water spots, I usually go back and do quick detailer and that's how i yeah so I, I, have a, I have a deionizer from griots that i hook yeah. up to the to the system and so i wash my car uh with, with regular water and then i do a rinse with the deionized water and mm -hmm. then i sort of let it air dry but then i also have a blower and mm -hmm. i blow most of it off and then i go back if it needs and just kind of spot spot clean yeah. whenever i wash a car i always quick detail it afterwards unless it's the golf yeah so <laughs> All right, let's see. There, throw up another car. So another uh, RWB. Now this is a 997 um, RWB. Obviously a wide body kit. Um, pretty wild. This was in the S Tech booth. S Tech makes uh, vinyl as well as PPF, and uh, it, it was a wild car. It had a ducktail. Uh, had some crazy wide rims. You know, RWBs aren't for everyone, but at SEMA, uh, an aftermarket show, this is probably one of the perfect cars so to have. If you want attention, oh, RWB yeah. is the way to I go. I mean, if you want your booth to be on Instagram, you put something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, Everybody has an opinion, and they're usually yeah. strong. So here's a car at the Guillaume booth that we know very well, and it was yeah. done 50-50 style. This is uh, Brock's uh, 996C4S with the tent. The Yakima tent on top. That's you know a famous Instagram uh, position that that car is normally in. So they did a 50/50 where they cleaned half the car and then they left half of it as he drove it for whatever trip he did in. And um, again, very Instagram <laughs> worthy. Next car, please. Uh, we can skip that one. That one was just a that was just a demonstration on. Uh, Finals. Now here's a car that really stood out, but it's not SEMA like at all, Manny. Yeah, it was a, a '74 914. Uh, a Porsche's official name was Limited Edition. Uh, internal or externally, and the fans call it the, either the Bumblebee or the Can Am car. Uh, Porsche wanted to call it the Can Am car, but Can Am, uh, the race series from SCCA, uh, was going to charge a fee uh, for every car they sold. And Porsche said, thanks, but no thanks. We'll just call it limited edition. So um, this is one of those cars. This car was left for dead. It was uh, needed a lot of rust repair. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the folks at Galpin, or Galpin? Galden. 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 Galden Porsche. Yeah. Um, so this car was actually part of the uh, West Coast Porsche Classic Challenge. We saw this car at Works Reunion. And as Manny said, it was left for dead, and and probably the restoration job on this car far exceeds its its value. 
but that wasn't the point for them. Um, the point for them was to take something that was left for dead, and man, they went through the car. They, they, there was areas on the car that were rusted out that you could not get replacement pieces for, so they actually formed um, you know, replacement inserts or, or panels that they needed. Obviously, they a lot of the parts uh, on the car from Porsche Classic, and um, yeah, it was it was it was cool to see a very stock car at SEMA. But it, it man, people gathered all any around. 914 uh, fans, and this drives me up the wall when because they go into the uh, uh, we're not love, no one likes us uh, underdog oh. thing. Uh, no. Uh, this <laughs> <Sorry>. car, <laughs> this car had a crowd of people around it all day long. Every time yeah. we went by there, there was people uh, angling to take photographs. It uh, was a stock 914, but yeah. you know it wasn't an RWB. Didn't have uh, lights or anything flashing on. It was just a basic 914. But it got the eyes of everyone to walk by was uh, taking photos of it. And, and what's very brave to bring that particular car to SEMA is. It is in the hall of you know cars that are you know detailed and you know polished to the nines, and they brought a black paint car to put on the showroom or the show floor, where these lights show everything, and uh, they were they they didn't even flinch, and the car looked amazing. So our listeners here, this is. Um 914 special edition black with yellow accents wasn't there another one that no, they called creamsicle. it a, the that was creamsicle, creamsicle but that was white and orange white yeah. and orange yeah okay all right next car please uh we can do another one that was just more uh, you know so what i did was i just took photos of every single porsche that was at sema so basically you get a porsche or a lamborghini yeah. and that's a great way to get people into your booth mm -hmm. it's probably a lot cheaper than hiring a uh Boy or girl? Booth boy. <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> I see what you're doing there. <laughs> I had to give me that host. look. <laughs> All right, so so back to this uh, the car that's on the screen here. Again, not everyone's cup of tea, but this was uh, a Cayman that was taking part in the Battle of the Builds. So uh, during the the SEMA show, there's a number of cars that are entered into the Battle of the Builds to showcase. You know the crazy things that you can do to cars customizing them and this car was wild i mean it was on the ground um i think the front lip uh, carbon fiber lip actually touched the floor so it's it's riding on air ride system it's got some crazy wide body system it's wrapped in purple uh, I, I don't know if I, s I sent a picture but uh, you can see that the air tanks modified exhaust crazy crazy car again not everybody's cup of tea but kudos to the person that put the time and energy to build this is this a uh, it's a battle to build so you're not yeah. looking for a stock cayman you're mm -hmm. looking for something that's really outlandish and i kind of liked it I, I didn't know what color it was i put it on my instagram feed and there it's was purple a, there was a lot of hate <laughs> as yeah. far as the color and i i thought it looked uh it's cool if you want to get attention it was to me like the right car because everyone once again was, yeah. was crowded around it taking photos this yeah. is the sort of color where if you hate it you probably hate the uh, frozen berry the well, Porsche I mean, offers as I well think, <laughs> I think cars at SEMA are just naturally yeah. very polarizing right mm -hmm. I mean if it wasn't polarizing it wouldn't be at SEMA mm -hmm. and I will guarantee you know how we do the one mile review about you know how, would the car be showcased at a um, at the the car meet a car like that purple came in would be at the very yeah. front of the show because everybody be like a nine nine and a half oh oh yeah Psh i said that car would be a 10. Yeah. You could give that car a 10. It would be right up as, front. As many cars crazy. as Porsche there were and Lamborghinis. Not too many Ferraris. Lamborghinis was the you know, attention getter to get people to come to your booth. I think there was an equal amount of cars with tents on top. Oh, yeah. And uh, I can't believe this many people are camping with their car or the tent <laughs> on top. Either that or they're planning to become homeless. But it's, I, uh, it's Or they just like the look of having, having a tent on top of your car. I, uh... Well, not only <laughs> tents, but they have these like um, almost like canop not canopies, but almost like you like they called it a bat wing where it's like it sits on the side of your SUV or, or car and then it swings around like a bat and it provides like a makes like a pavilion thing. And I'm just thinking that's cool. But how many people are actually sitting under there? Because like I know, like if I go to a DE or an autocross, like I don't just like put a chair next to my car and sit there. Like I go out and I talk to people, and I like, always bring a chair. I'm never buy my car. I always yeah. bring a chair, but I never sit in it. But yeah. You find a friend who has a canopy. It's like having a friend of a pool. No, then I mean, you go yeah. hang out. Yes, you do, because you would come over to our canopy and hang out. Okay, maybe at right. a club race or something. 
<laughs> yeah. But there was, um, I mean, the the whole outdoor adventure thing. I think uh, there's a photo of an off-road Cayenne. There it is. This was by Berg Performance. Another, this was an Instagram post that I did while we were out there that garnered, I think, 20-some thousand. That was a very nice build. It was a super That was nice actually build. out on the uh, sidewalk uh, mm -hmm. um, around one of the uh, uh, SEMA or the convention center buildings. Um, this one here, this was uh, it's a 911. It looks like a C2. It's a cabriolet. That's what I didn't catch. And, you were you yeah. were saying they're taking pictures. I'm like, what yeah. are you taking pictures of? And, and I, I noticed the rear, rear quarter windows um, were very sharp, and that's what caught my eye. And I looked, and I could see the line of a hardtop. So they took what looked to be a 964 cab, and either they cut the roof off or they used a um, existing hardtop convertible and, and had a hardtop. But that a, Russell built car. That was a cab starting out, so I wonder if there's well, something I think, structurally. I, I forget where I read, but to have a proper roll bar for the things that they're doing, they prefer to use a cab. Interesting. Yeah, well, and then just handle the roof themselves. The intake, yeah. the picture you can't mm -hmm. see with the intake, the way the intake was to have access to it, you had to have a removable roof. But it was very subtle, like I said. Uh, he, I, like, I, I, didn't I walked right by the fact that it was a, a cab. I was I, taking some detailed shots, and that's when I noticed the um, seam on the roof, and I realized it was a... Uh, Cabriolet, but yeah, it was uh, every car was uh, unique. So, so, so at SEMA, as you can tell, everything's extreme. It's gonna, either going to be super tall, super big wheels and high, or it's going to be slammed to the ground and you can't put a piece of paper under the front chin spoiler. But uh, here's just another car out, sitting outside. Uh, Porsche is well represented. Oh, now this is probably the best looking Porsche booth at uh, SEMA, and this is the Tech Art booth. And we actually recently. Um, did a video or posted a video on the uh, GT Street R Cabriolet. That was the U.S. debut at SEMA. We did a, uh, a video on it. Uh, this this uh, white, uh, I think it's a G, is it a GT3? No, it's not a GT3. If it's not, it kind of looks no, like one now. Yeah, so so this, this white and blue, uh, it's probably at 992 something. Uh, anyways, had a lot of, you know, very cool looking modifications. That car will be at Unstock. Um, this Sunday, so so the uh, the, the blue uh, one on the other end of that um, display, they had three cars. Uh, Tycom was in the middle, and uh, you know the guys from Tech Car were their friends with us, so we yep. were going to dinner with them, and they're really fun. They're from Germany, but they love being here in the U.S. Uh, it was amazing when we heard that this uh, this car that we featured on the uh, video was a Heritage Edition, not eleven Turbo. <laughs> Turbo S. That's yeah. like saying, you know what? That's too boring for me. That's exactly what they said. Uh, and and I want something even more special. Yeah. And uh and, and it, they delivered. Yeah. Uh, the the leather uh they had they installed in this car with the perforations that were was it a CAD machine that uh, cut out CNC. the holes or CNC machine CNC rather. Machine. Um yeah, it was a, every little detail they um looked at on this car and uh, you, you kept on yeah. finding more and more things that they had done to the car that was special. Yeah, they, um, it's, as Manny said, it started as a Heritage Edition uh, 911 Turbo S, and um, you know they customized it to the The color, as I mentioned in the video, looks like a very custom color, but it's not. It's actually a factory color, but the way it pops in the metallic, it looks really cool. Uh, one of the comments on um, the, the video was the fact that, you know, oh, there's too much carbon fiber in the vents. It looks too um, JDM or whatever they said. But the funny thing is, do those do the people that say that stuff about this car say the same thing about the GT3 RS? Because it has the same fenders and the carbon and stuff like that. Are they only saying it? Well, in some way, the GT3 RS does have carbon, but those you know like on the uh, the fenders and all that it's yeah. it's black plastic so black plastic. would you rather have black plastic or carbon fiber I, i'd probably pick carbon fiber that's, uh, that's one percent of the world problem yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyways that was a very cool car and then it was cool to see uh the faf uh race car in its uh, plaid livery once again i mean the, the idea for these people to bring these cars or companies to bring these cars to sema is to get you you know to take pictures in their booth and they certainly did um, this next car is one that uh, people have mixed reactions about because the power plant is not ice. The power plant is a Tesla motor and batteries. And this is the Carrera EV made by what company? There was two companies, and this wasn't the uh, 
the G, electric GT. That was the uh, 930, I think. Okay, okay. But any of these cars, I would love to do a one-mile review. Actually, I would like to do a 10-mile or 100-mile review on. Yeah. Uh, but I would love to drive an electric conversion car to see what uh, what that's like. Yeah, and I think they say that, you know, with everything that they do to the car, if you want to go back to, you know, the ICE, engine, the ICE power plant, um, you know, down the road, you can. Because the way they've designed it is, is I wouldn't say it's plug-and-play, but it's not invasive to the chassis or invasive to w the point where you can't return it back to I stock. I don't know. This car had it, uh, but the, I know the electric GT had it, where the um, charging port was where the gas uh, mm -hmm. tank was. Yeah, they try to make filler. it, you know, fairly <laughs> stock. Um, but imagine all these cars have instantaneous torque. Um, probably the range is going to be in the hundreds, not, not like a... Uh, daily driver, but still, I mean, that's you can have electric cool. air conditioning, yep, yep. electric heat, all and the stuff the old 911s didn't really have. Yep. Now, I think Robert threw up, yeah, so the Hunan Pegasus uh, is running now, and they drove it in and had it on display at the Mobile One booth. And uh, again, by the time you listen to this, we should have the Hunan Pegasus at Unstock as well. And they had the whole rear uh, section cover off of the car, so we got to see more than we did at works. And just the the amount of work they put into this car to put oh. this water cool and there was GT3 always a crowd, always a crowd yeah. around it. It was. Um, so you said they drove well, it in. They drove it in. So yeah. they fixed it. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. That's great. Randy found out that uh, he was explaining to us the car is wider than a standard uh, trailer. <laughs> so the person they had contracted to bring the car to Vegas brought his rig it didn't fit yeah, so he so found man. another trailer had to go like drive i don't know how many hours go pick up that trailer come back because that trailer was a, like was like an inch and a half or two inches yeah. wider yeah but because the huna pegasus is so wide um when, when they when they dropped it off and picked it up for unstock we helped them load it onto the trailer and there's literally an inch on each side of the car yeah not a lot of room not a lot of room next one please uh, you can pass that one. That was a dyno. They used a Once again, they used 911 to get for attention. It works. It works because yeah. I took a photo mm -hmm. of it. Another uh, Safari build. This was at, I think, one of the shock um, one of the shock booths. Oh, this Lots is the one. Uh, I remember this one. That was the one that... Uh, I think that's the Olin's booth. That's... Uh, yeah. And, he, that, yeah. and he, had, he uses it a lot. Oh, yeah. Because he, um, he couldn't use it three weeks prior to SEMA. Because he had to, he spent three weeks cleaning it yeah. from it was so dirty had so many pebbles and uh, stones from going off road that uh, he was prohibited from driving it <laughs> until uh, SEMA was over. And we invited this car to come to Unstock as well. And he's like, "Well, what if I get it dirty?" We're like, "Bring it with the dirt. You don't have to clean it to bring yeah, it to we're Unstock. Not, uh, just just bring it as it will look better with the dirt." I think yeah. on uh, at SEMA. So here's another 997 RWB. I don't think I've. One, I've never seen a 997 RWB in person outside of SEMA, but there were a lot of them. And I guess that's, to me, that's probably the biggest that, The delivery the reminded me of that uh, BASF right. delivery that was uh, uh, in the 90s, yep. popular on the 962s and 956s. And if you love wheels, wheels, I mean, there are all different types of wheels at uh, oh. SEMA. And you can... You have stuff that gives a, you know a nod to historic wheels. You have some crazy new designs and probably a million different color combinations. Like I love this. how they didn't even blink when they said uh, five seven thousand dollars per wheel. Oh yeah, not at it all. It was like, nope. Yep, you got to ask. You can't afford it. Right, and and, and also carbon barreled wheels. Now yeah. all sorts of carbon barreled wheels. So here's another uh, wrapped. Uh, no, I don't think this was not a wrapped GT3. This was at. Uh, one of the wheel booths, a sort of a uh, uh, more more plain or more classic five spoke wheel. Now here, this uh, Ruby Ruby Star, uh, wide bodied, nine, decent. Yep, that was on the Toyo Tread Pass. Again, crazy colors, crazy idea. Look at how they did the tail light treatment on it as one bar, similar to more modern cars, but that that's a nine nine seven, right? So. Um, they converted the rear of the 997 to look more like a modern Porsche. So Toyo has claimed this area that uh, is, I, kudos to SEMA for thinking of this, but it's it connects to two buildings. So instead of just walking across, uh, you know, barren landscape, they made this a Toyo, uh, Toyo tread pass. So mm -hmm. you get to go for this car show as you're going from one building 
uh, to the other on the outside and it's uh it makes people stop along the way and yeah. look at uh, all the cars that are sponsored by toyo a lot of cool cars all right so anything else we want to talk about sema or we move on we've got a lot of stuff to cover yeah it was uh, it, uh ron and robert showing more and more of the uh the cars but it was uh, three days of intense uh, walking um and, and i know we didn't see everything because yeah. some of the scuff we uh we just uh blew through but so, uh, I am happy to report, you know, in meeting with our our partners and sponsors. Whereas last year, when we sat to talk with them, a lot of them were like, you know, we're, we're trying to do our thing, but we're just not sure of inventory and stock, and we don't know what the future is going to hold. I'm happy to report back most everyone that we spoke with uh, at SEMA this year that you know stock and inventory is not at its normal level, but it's certainly you know, turning around for them. And uh, that's good for those of you that are looking for, you know, shocks or tires or wheels and things are getting better for them, which means accessibility is better for all of us. And we did line up some more uh, sponsors for Project 964. Oh, for yeah. those of you who have been wondering about the club's 964. So and, we can uh, announce, we can announce the shocks, right? Yeah, KW. KW is going to take care of shocks. We have some other people that are looking at uh, for upgrades. And wheels um, and seats. Yep, seats. It was uh, very, uh, very well received. Um, the project uh, when we told them what we wanted to do with it, and uh, it's um, yeah. So I think you know the next couple of months as these parts come in, we're gonna you know start hopping on the nine six four and get it ready winter for winter project. Yeah, yeah. Reveal hopefully at Amelia. All right, so that wraps up SEMA, and um, some of you flew home, and I tried to get to uh, Costa Rica for a, a wedding slash vowel renewal. I'd never been there before. And uh, for those of you that have done air travel lately, you will probably uh, feel and, and understand what I'm talking about. But my, my flight got canceled and I ended up doing this whole trains, planes, automobiles and buses. And uh, it was a whirlwind and it was crazy. So you got back and then the next day we got back from Vegas that literally pulled into my driveway at three in the morning correct and that was a thursday going into friday because i so went to work so the that next was day. friday morning yeah i got like three hours sleep then i came into the office but you got back on a plane and you flew to new york no, no. That's, so we were supposed to go from bwi to dallas and then dallas to costa rica so yes i, I think i went to bed at like three or three or four a.m friday morning and then that afternoon we were supposed to fly to dallas they canceled our trip to Dallas, so now we got rerouted to go to DCA, to Miami, and then to Dallas, and then to Costa Rica. But to do all that, we had to take a train from Columbia to Union Station, and then take the Metro to DCA, and then we took a plane to Miami, and then we slept in the terminal for about four or five hours, and then we made it to Dallas and caught up to the Dallas to Costa Rica flight and then once we got to Costa Rica, we took like an hour and a half bus ride full of, you know, third world country roads, pothole ridden, but we got there on time. And uh, it's, it's funny, like my, my wife, she was kind of stressed and, um, you know, uh, we, we travel quite a bit and we just, uh, I, I just kind of roll with the punches and we still got there. So it's all good. Yeah, she was a trooper. There she is sleeping in a rocking chair <laughs> in the terminal. I'm sure she appreciates that photo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so anyways, uh, oh, I can I unveil something? I just got some cool stuff to unveil. That's oh, new. Oh, yes, yeah. All yeah. right, let me, uh, give me a second. <clears throat> this is our uh, home shopping network part of the show. All right, so we have, you know, we, we've done partnerships with Porsche Design and Porsche Classic. Obviously, you know the Classic Club Coupe. But by the time you listen to this, I am happy to share with you probably one of the coolest pair of shoes that are the Classic Club Coupe Limited Edition, uh, 1,955 pairs available. And I think we've got the photos going up there. Yep. So it's together with Puma, PCA, and Porsche Design. And yeah, so these are, these are also going to be unveiled um, at Unstock, and uh, that's just a just a cool project we did. Result, should, so I'm not them. usually a fan of you know kind of brand centric things like that, but th those actually look really good. Yeah, 
They are. They are. Sweet. Dare I ask how much they they're going to cost, or do you know that? The, and the thing is, it's very reasonable in terms of <laughs> kicker uh, yeah. kicks, uh, kickers. Um, but not seventy dollar Pumas at DSW. Jeez. No, but for custom and yeah. beautiful box and rep the yeah. you know the club that you love the most, one hundred and fifty bucks. No, it's not bad. That's not, actually that's very an reasonable. amazing amazing deal. Yeah, yeah. So what I recommend is buy two pairs because yeah. one. You want to keep in the display cabinet, and then the other pair you actually wear. I, I could see a lot of PCA members oh, buying yeah. two pairs no, just where, so they could get the where box. Where do you buy these shoes, the shoes from? Because I, I, I don't see uh, 2,000 pairs of shoes in our office yet. No, so that's the beauty is um, you know Porsche Design holds all the inventory. This is not something that is costing PCA. It's just a collaboration, and you'll buy them directly through Porsche Design. And we'll have, we'll have the links on uh, PCA.org. We're also going to put it up on uh, social media. But you can only buy them if you are a PCA member. Which are is, they uh, you know, North American sizes or European sizes? Uh, North American sizes, but I mean, on the tongue of the um, the shoe, it, it shows the European sizes too. But yeah, it's a North American shoe. Oh, the box is excellent. I like the box. Yeah. All right, and one more thing. One more thing. So another collaboration with Porsche Design is this travel trolley. That's the one that you are able to bring on the plane and we had it matched to PCA's Club Blau 287C and it's a beautiful trolley. This one is even uh, more rare. This is only 300 pieces available. Comes with a custom um, uh, luggage tag that shows that it's one of 300. You'll always know which luggage is yours. Yes, exactly. My, my only thing is I will feel terrible if they don't let me bring it on the plane and they say, you must check your bag. Like, oh man, that would crush me. But anyways, these aren't that, you know, pricing wise for something this custom with locks and it's, you know, everything Porsche design. This is four ninety nine. So again, by the time you listen to this, most of these will probably be sold so out. Every club coupe owner has to buy one. If I had a club coupe, I would because buy Because that's matching luggage yeah. at a pretty affordable price. And everybody who chose Club Blau as a PTS on their non club coupe car, which several people have, that also you have to buy it. Anyway, so that's an exclusive debut for those of you that uh, listen to Porsche Club Insider. Oh, oh um, speaking of the Porsche Club Insider and and things that we, uh, let's say, um, we talk about ultimate combos and in and out and the f- french fries combo. We actually pulled it together when we were at, uh, when we were in Las Vegas and we stopped by in and out because Manny said the fries need to be the most fresh. So we, he wanted hot fries. So we got the burgers first, then we got our large order of McDonald's fries and we did a photo shoot for the ultimate or the PCA insider combo and that is uh, you know what I'm going to say if you want fresh fries you don't go to McDonald's (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's probably heated up in a microwave it was delicious but anyways that is a photo shoot we did on the hood of our rental car listen when you start washing your car on a regular basis you can comment (laughs) about french fries (laughs) although I must say that uh and I'll post some of this on our Instagram for uh, Porsche Club Insider. Uh, but it was like being married to a uh, Instagram wife because uh, Ilko and I are in the car, pretty hungry, watching Vu with the food on the hood, taking pictures uh, of the, and trying to pose it properly with the lighting and whatnot while uh, everyone's driving around us. And here he is uh, at the Instagram. Uh, but man, guy. did it turn out? You guys were like laughing at me, but that photo is phenomenal. Like, yeah, you couldn't have paid a, a marketing company to take a better photo. I think Yoku got the double double. I got the single. Yes, he did. He was hungry that day. Well, he never eats breakfast, so or lunch or that, lunch. That was a snack. Yeah. All right, let's get into the news. What's going on? Where do you? Man, we got news. We, you had news. So my that laptop you, died since I had it in the uh, conference meeting. When, uh, oh. I didn't realize the battery was running low. So, so read you, me off. You, you chose some news yesterday, which you know you always prepare for in advance. But as of this morning, we got even more news. So, so let's start uh, with uh, Porsche released their style edition, um, uh, which was a Cayman and Boxster. Yeah, ones that uh, what is it, Neo Ruby Star? Yeah, it looks like Ruby Star. Yeah, but yeah. it's not. It's called Neo Ruby. I had someone at Cars and Coffee say, uh, you know, I was all set to order my uh, 
Turbo S and Ruby Star, but now they're coming out with the style edition. I don't think I'm going to because it's not going to seem that special anymore, which made me think about it. I'm like, mm. we've seen a lot of Ruby Star. I, Ruby what, Star, like Neo. the last one or two years, yeah. it's just been like it's over hot. and for such a rare color, we've been seeing it yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So the style edition, of course, is uh, much like Porsche does special edition cars. It comes with a lot of neat uh, extra features. I, I do like the white wheels on it. That's a nice. Uh, That's also an Ilko favorite. He loves white wheels. Yeah, it's uh, if it's done right, it's uh, it's a nice touch to it. It'll be interesting. To see, uh, I would imagine these all sell out. Oh, yeah, of course. It, uh, so, what do you think the Neo adds? Do you think the Neo adds like metallic, or is it brighter? Or you know, when it comes, it's hard to, it's me, hard when to, it comes to color, I, know, I'm not I walk a you. thin line as far Mr. as colorblind. I'm not asking you. I'm, I'm not asking sure. It, there's something different about it. Yeah. When we look at that, uh, it doesn't Carrera look RS. as dark as. Uh, yeah, it does look brighter, but, it, I don't but know it's that's so hard. It's so hard on a on a laptop or computer. Yeah. They probably. I'm. What I'd bet, you know, is is they probably change the color slightly, maybe because the the same paint technologies are possibly not even allowed to be used where they're painted in Germany. No, because you know, Ruby, Star, Ruby Star. I mean, Ruby Star is still a PTS. Color, yeah, I guess right? so. Ruby Star is PTS. I don't know. They're just so smart. We'll they have just, to ask Boris. They, by adding Neo, <laughs> now it's just an even more rare color. <laughs> They're so yeah. smart. They, they get us all the time. Um, all right. So that's the Boxster Style Edition. What else? There was the two experimental prototypes that went up uh, oh, yeah. at a Volcano in Chile. Man, yeah, Porsche didn't hold secrets very well. Yeah, uh, you know, They released this a few days ago saying uh, uh, that they... Uh, sent this all-wheel drive like like it was a surprise everyone yeah. in their brother knows about porsche working on this uh, off-road car well here's the thing this is not the dakar that they just announced today right. like an hour no, or two ago uh, but this is like this yeah. is the 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 research lab basically yeah. for that car right i'm not sure because the, these are not the same cars and they said they drove the dakars more than three hundred thousand miles and this mm -hmm. seems like it's a one-time thing at least so far. So yeah. this is this a is separate way, project. This is way more aggressive. Yeah, this is something you couldn't drive on the street, and the Dakar is going to be a street car yeah. that, that can actually come but out. But I look at the Dakar, and I'm wondering, is it really off-road worthy? Like this one here, and the Shotza, and the things yeah. that it's doing, it is like truly off-road. Yeah. But well, the Dakar, I mean, the, the ground clearance and all that kind of stuff is... Kind of mild. Yeah, well, if uh, Robert goes to those pictures of the the car and the in the sand dunes, um, that's the 911 the car. The black one, Robert. The, the black one. Um, I sent that really. It literally just came out before the podcast, so I sent it over to Robert. But it's uh, on the sand dunes. You know, it reminds me of the old Cayenne Turbo photos. You mm -hmm. know, out in um, the sand dunes, like 15, 20 years ago. And there are some pictures on here that show Walter Roll testing it on ice. Um, like that road right there? Like that's not a very aggressive road. I mean Yeah, well if Robert keeps going, I mean it Okay, that one's pr that one's pretty It's not aggressive. it's not the the experimental prototypes, right. but for something that's I'm guessing is going to be sold to customers as a street car, that is Well, they're going to debut at the bad. LA Auto Show. Yeah, we already yeah. know yeah. that. For those yep. of you that have tickets to the LA Auto Show preview, I'm guessing you're going to get to see this in person. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's it, such a cool photo. Yeah, but it doesn't look that off road. I mean, the yeah, aggressive well, tires, but the, the uh, ride I'll pass height. along your sentiments too. No, I'm not trying to be critical. There. I'm not yeah. trying to be critical. I'm just saying, you well, know, what, off road like, as it can be. And I mean, well, Mia Walsh's car that you drove, the Safari, like that's not super off road, but it's just enough raise with the knobbly tires that it can do stuff. You know, it can really. But remember, they're you know, not building a uh, one off SEMA off roader. They're building a car that people can use, yeah. so they're going to have compromises. Yeah, it's very easy to slap on a tire on top of your uh, roof and uh, some lights and call it an off-road car. Yeah, yeah. So they've tested this more than three hundred thousand miles between all the test cars, and then more than six thousand miles off-road. So they've they've done their research. Wow, and you know they're going to sell everyone. Oh yeah, they're going to sell everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. What, what I'm are looking forward to for is allocations. So being a Safari 911, you know what I'm looking forward to for those cars? Hmm. Is the different liveries that'll come in. Oh, yeah. Right? Because like they, 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 they're debuting in black, I think, in, on purpose, because the next punch 
is going to be, oh, this car is going to be offered in a... The heritage well, Rothmans edition. Exactly. This, th these black cars are actually still the development mules, prototypes. They be, they haven't actually unveiled the car as it will look yet. So oh, that's, so that's maybe, coming. Maybe we'll see that at yeah. L.A. Well, we will. So yeah. the actual car will be at L.A. But no, but I mean like a, we, a potential we do know, We do yeah. know what the... Um, we do know what the livery is going to be. Don't you remember from Parade? I do, but I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but really, yeah, these, these are prototypes, <laughs> not not the ones that will be at LA Auto Show. Yeah. So, like like Manny said, they'll sell every single one of them. I think yep. people will be pleasantly surprised when they see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Still, uh, even though we know what it's going to be, it's going to be uh, fun to see it in person and to hear the story behind it and how, you know, Porsche's reasoning for building it. Yeah. I mean, kudos to uh, Porsche for building something this, like this. I don't know how many other manufacturers uh, who aren't into, uh, you know, taking a sports car and turning it into an off-road capable vehicle. Yeah. So do we want to talk about the Boxster or do you want to go somewhere else first? Uh, we can bring up the Boxster EV. Yeah. So we're starting to see uh, these spy shots. And we knew the Boxster is going to turn, Boxster and Cayman are going to become... Uh, electric or at least transform over to uh, electric and so these were some uh, pr uh, spy photos of the prototype being tested no exhaust pipes um this is going to be very exciting yeah and, and what i love about uh, this is it still looks very much like it looks like a boxer a boxer yeah. uh, uh, you know not as radical as the mission r right um you can tell all their headlights are starting to uh, mimic the the tycons mm -hmm. um, but it still has big intakes in the front uh, bumper cover for i'm guessing the radiators for to cool the batteries whereas yeah. you know not to knock a tesla but you know a tesla front end is just so closed and doesn't have any well, you kind can of see style. all the active arrow all those yeah. flaps mm -hmm. that are um but it's funny that it still has a little tailpipe in the back but i think it's just like a blank panel it looks like a sticker maybe uh -huh. to, f to, f to fool people right yeah and then what would this would this be the first electric potential platform for like a two-door that would be an all-wheel drive electric car i don't think they've said whether it's going to be all-wheel drive well, yet it's or going not. to be the two motor four motor i would mm -hmm. imagine they're going to have yeah. a four motor option yeah I would think because so. the uh, uh why wouldn't they have a four motor exactly man so can you imagine electric power four wheel power i think of what think chris so. harris said about uh you know when when the first person to come out with a fun mm -hmm. electric car is the one that's going to dominate the market so i wonder if we're looking at and not that the tycon isn't fun but having a, a purpose-built sports car yeah um it, it's going to be exciting uh, crazy idea so like let's let's take the tycon that is offered with two wheel two wheel drive and all wheel drive right but you're buying it based on the model. Like, do you think they'll ever make a sports car version of that, say the all wheel drive version, but you're able to select and move it into two wheel drive mode so you can kind of be a hooligan? I with wouldn't it. be surprised. I mean, BMW does that with their, what is it, M5, where you can, you can turn off the front? You can turn, it's an all wheel drive car and you can turn off the front, front drive for, for drift mode. I would be interested so, in that option. That's yeah. pretty cool. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, yeah. that's, those are the kind of options that, you know, electric motors make but as easy. opposed to the BMW one, that switching to all wheel drive doesn't give you more power. No. But on no. an electric car switching would, to yeah. uh, oh, it I see does give saying. you more yeah, power. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the Remax Nevera also has so that's, you know, a four motor, one motor for each wheel. That has nearly two thousand horsepower, but they do have a drift mode. And yes, it's it's less power because you you're taking off. away the yeah. yeah. Cool though. It's a good problem to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah, a, th a thousand horsepower or eighteen hundred. Uh. <laughs> in, in, in a boxer, that's uh, that's incredible. Yeah. So let's see. So next up is the last <laughs> of the uh, it's very cool livery uh, they had on the um, the final GTE car, uh, the nine eleven uh, race car coming out. It's um, basically on the windshield. Uh, for those of you not watching the YouTube version, it, it says goodbye mm. in each of the cars. And it's a little sad, but it's uh, one, one heck of a ride this uh, GT 911R had, yeah. uh, GT3R rather, um, for Porsche and racing. So it'll be exciting what the next chapter brings. Yeah. Uh, or RS, these are RSRs, aren't they? Is it the RSR? 
I think that's the RSR. Yeah, because yeah. I think they were still running the old RSRs in, in GTE. Oh, GTE. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I'm thinking about the US. So no more mid-engine 911, yep. at least for now, right? There was never mid-engine 911. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, not until they hit the racetrack. <laughs> All right. Oh, I also wanted to thank everyone for their input when we were talking about my uh, searching for my, my daughter's car. We're getting closer, and uh, a number of you chimed in. And no, a, a Cayenne is not within budget, even though it's four-wheel drive, and a Cayenne manual uh, is not in the cards. So as of right now, the, the two cars that are in, well, really the only car that's in the lead is a, the Subaru Crosstrek or an mm -hmm. Impreza. That's the update on that one, and we'll see. And the right now, f trying to get the monies for the car that was totaled, and then figuring out: Are we buying a car in Utah? Are we buying a car in Maryland? And then I got to drive it to Utah. I'd buy in Utah if you can. Well, the Believe problem is if I buy right. it in Utah, she has to buy it, and then she has to go on her own insurance. Oh, I see. But if I buy it in Maryland, it's my car, mm -hmm. and I can keep her on my insurance. Well, I, I know what uh, you know fits that bill. Is you said Impreza, but why not a WRX? Uh, insurance, insurance oh, on a WRX man. is probably one yeah. of the most expensive cars to insure because most people that own WRXs are highly prone to getting into situations. I think so. The Toyota pickup trucks added with, added the. Uh, um, that's also going to be high in insurance. Tacoma pickup trucks are uh, yeah yeah yeah. Are yeah. Much well, higher. the Tacoma is just too big. She wanted she 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 thought of a Tacoma, but then she realized how big it was, and yeah. It's not big if you start off with an F-250. Correct. But, yeah. And she's also 5'2", barely. So but That's the average height of most women driving the uh, big, big, big trucks that they climb into. Them. Yeah. So we'll update you and let you know what we finally uh, settle on. But I'm in this car shopping mode that it's not really a fun car shopping thing. It's more of out of necessity. And uh, now that the, the insurance is settled, the, uh, the number of days you have with the rental car goes away and so she's gonna have to uber or we got to find a car pretty quickly yeah so right. since we're on updates i might as well just give you a quick update uh, i've received some texts and emails about um my cat that my girlfriend and i have <laughs> and yeah What's so your I, cat's name again uh pierogi patch pierogi. patch, yeah. patch. patch maybe pierogi. patch now so patch pierogi. so when we came into the last episode of, of porsche club insider about three minutes before the episode started i was told my girlfriend texted me call me now and so I did, and she basically said, we're going to probably have to take the cat's eye out. You know, um, the doctor is saying that's probably the best way to go. Well, the cat's eye was taken out, um, and uh, Pierogi's doing very well, almost as if she never had a right eye in oh. the first place. So we're all good there. Good. Yeah. So they they put something in there and then just sewed it shut. So it yeah, they like put. They, it. Yeah. I, I had a, the feeling they're going to put in like a glass eye and and leave the eyelids you open. know open yeah. so it would look you know like she had an eye. But no, they sew it shut and that's there. That little fake eyeball is just so it doesn't look like it's a sunken you know oh. piece of skin where the eye used to be. But well, she's, she's doing great. She's doing great. Good. So and good. thank you for those who uh, reached out. You should have got a GoFundMe page started. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Yeah. For patches, pierogi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've uh, released some videos since we uh, were last together. Yeah, yeah man, we, what a whirlwind. We recorded on the Monday, I think, last time, so it was actually over seven days. Yeah, I feel like looking back at which uh, videos to include. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this was the one we did right after our um, podcast last time we recorded. Yeah, so that's at work one where Porsche exclusive manufacturer and um, – uh, the Sonderwunsch program are operated out of, and and Vu is there um, to get an inside look at how they do what they do. And if you want to do it, that's he'll tell you how how to do that. It's a contact in the dealer, I think, mm -hmm. who will put you in contact with with the people yeah, over in Germany. Yeah, and what we learned is, you know, we know that people can do, you know, paint a sample, mm -hmm. special wishes and stuff with their dealer. They can also go to L.A. They can also go to Atlanta. But I didn't realize you could also make an appointment to have a, a session at uh, in Stuttgart and they're not there to sell you a car. They're simply mm -hmm. there to help you put together a combination that uh, you would like. And then once you do that, then you settle sort of the, the financials with whatever dealer and you order your car. Yeah, so the big draw here is just going to Germany and experiencing it at the factory. Yeah, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if they exactly have a different database in which they 
think of what options you might have. It's probably the same, but I think when you're in Germany, maybe there are some combinations that stateside you wouldn't normally have considered mm -hmm. that they bring to your attention and then you go, ooh, that's popular. And, mm -hmm. you know, in Germany, maybe that's something you might want to consider. So the I'm caveat not, yeah. I would say is uh, and that we found this out from at Parade. So we had Boris Hapernick, who's head of Porsche Exclusive, come from Germany to Parade. And he is very generous of his time and spoke to everyone who had questions, yeah. particularly those who were going to order a car or had ordered a car <laughs> or had questions about options. And basically, everything that somebody wanted to do, Boris said, yes, mm -hmm. we can do that. Um, and of course, these people, uh, as soon as they got back home, called their dealer up and said, um, I want to change these options to this options and I want this, this and this. And the dealer had to explain to them that they can't do that in the U.S. At which point they said, well, no, uh, Boris said we can. Mm. So uh, evidently, to much to your point about uh, there not being all the options in the U.S., if you do speak with Boris, just remember that I don't think Boris has a, uh, a beautiful mind type thing where he remembers every option, the uh, availability of every different country. You're close so, to it, though. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. Uh, remember that even though, yes, they can do this, it may not be applicable to, to the you. car coming to the U.S. Exactly. And we're talking like minute little uh, leather uh, changes or stitching and, and whatnot that... Uh, or maybe even a wheel style that was never cleared to be, you know, through USDOT or NHTSA, yeah. um, but it's available in, in Germany. Stuff but like that. It's very cool yeah. to be able to uh, really customize a car. Yeah. It's a dream car. You might as well do it the right way. And have it built to your uh, your specification the way you would love to see a car, and you can spend hours at exclusive with all the different options they have and possibilities. And what I thought was cool is they have no less than a dozen cars that they have built um, at exclusive, and I think it's you know it's all parked in that courtyard when you'll see uh, when you watch the video. But I think seeing the paint combinations and the different treatments on the interior and the wheel color combos seeing it live outside on a car versus you know what it might look like on a screen um can really generate some excitement and some uh, thoughts and ideas of what you would want to do to your own car because you're touching it you're seeing it in person as opposed to just you know trying to imagine what your combination would look like so very cool stuff so speaking of very cool stuff, Damon, you got to drive a crazy Panamera. Yeah. Um, it was loud and low. Yes, and, it was. Um, I liked it just right. <laughs> it was a bit controversial online, though. Yes, it was. It's, um, you know, there, there are always jokes about, you know, are, are pops and bangs good or pops and bangs bad and et cetera, et cetera. And I think we can all agree that it's a very, it's a great looking Panamera, the mm -hmm. way it's lowered a little bit. You know, with lowering modules and it's black. It's a very sleeper sort of car. And it's a wagon. And it's a wagon. It's yeah. a Sport Turismo. Um, there is a, an engine tune, a transmission tune, and I believe it was the downpipe was replaced and muffler delete. Um, and I don't think that those last two mods make really any difference to how pops and bangs happen. But mm -hmm. I believe that's the the engine tune. But you start on normal mode and it's loud, pleasantly loud. You go to sport sounds great in the pops and bangs start and then yeah. your sport plus and I, it, it sounds like somebody firing a machine gun <laughs> so it, it might be a little loud you know for some people including me the pops and bangs part but i love the sound of the exhaust it was much faster than a uh, panamera turbo s that we've driven it definitely has more than i think what was it 670 horsepower now i so, think i think the pops and bangs affected your rating scale because this car is the way you rated it. I was surprised at how high the numbers you gave. Yeah, I was surprised as well. It's it's a uh, like car show for me. It, it's a sleeper, so it looks cool to me, but it might not stand out to everybody. But people in the know will know that that's a very special car. But a slew of eights. So when was the last time you gave a car a slew of eights on? Well, rating? here's the thing with our rating system is that it doesn't always tell the full story of the car. You know, for for ratings, you know, they're applicable, but. You know, um, would I rather have this or a GT3? Of course I'd rather have a GT3, even though its daily driving would be less, its road trip would be less, but, you know, its fun factor would be higher. But um, overall, it's just such a 
the Panamera is a great car. It's it does everything really well, and having more power, the car is act, it's capable of handling it. You know, it's more about making sure that you're capable of handling it. And to me, a car like that, you know, will provide fun for a long time because yeah. you're able to grow into it, and that's what that car felt like to me. So I it, it the, scored I, high. I love the pops and bangs when I'm in the car driving. Yeah, when I'm outside of the car. It's annoying as hell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it, it's not bad per se, but I'm the type of person I, I don't really like to attract too much attention when I'm on the road via the exhaust because you can really yeah. you can zoom right in. Where, where is that coming from? Oh, that Porsche right you there. You don't want to be that Dodge Charger or Challenger yeah. that's sitting in traffic and yeah. you know, nails the throttle every yeah. ten feet it moves. Or, or pulling up to my driveway and. Oh. Poof, 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 you know, but at the midnight thing is, after that car, flight. you can turn it off, right? I mean, you didn't. Yeah, have to yeah. Pops if and if bangs it's a normal time. mode, normal you're mode. not going to hear a ton of pops and bangs. I think it's that's ideal. You can have doc, was it Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, right? Yeah. You can be quiet when you get home. Yeah. And then if you want to be a hooligan, you crank up the wick and. Yeah. There I'll you be go. a hooligan, but without the pops and bangs. <laughs> that, that's how I see it. But it was a great car. I, I really think it's loved a great it. looking car. I wish I got to drive it. Yeah. Well, you can rent it on Turo. I did like the comment that said, "I like to see what it's like a year from now." Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to think that, you know, there's that engine tune on the car, and it's not a, didn't start as a Turbo S model, which has, I believe, some slightly different engine internals to yeah. help cope with the extra boost. So if this was a straight GTS, which has 473 horsepower stock, yeah, you crank up the boost to 800 Ooh. horsepower and you're not changing anything, then... Ooh. Yeah, we'll and see. you're renting it out. And you're renting it out. Yeah. Well, hopefully you know, he makes the money back. I mean, that's probably the goal, right? I, you know, so. kudos, kudos to the owner because, man, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I I would have problems, you know, putting my Honda Odyssey on tour. I can't imagine having a beautiful, yep. fast, crazy car like that and just handing the keys over to someone that's willing to log on and yep. whatever deposit they put on it. But you must be 30 years old or older. So did he say how much he charges uh, per day for that? Yeah, I, I took a look, and it's uh, I believe it's 330 per day, mm-hmm. which not bad. Not, it's I mean, not bad for, it for that level of car. Yeah. I think it's cheaper it's than Hertz, right? I would think so. Probably, yeah. yeah. Huh. Very cool. Yeah, it's a very sharp-looking car. Yeah. So we talked about um, the Tech Art uh, 911 uh, GT Street R Cabriolet video that we, we did at SEMA. Um, again, thank you for the comments uh, for the last podcast. We're still, I mean, we're still all the ratings for our, our podcast, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we are, because of our consistent weekly, you know, drops of the video, and I, and I thank everyone for listening, and maybe this is a perfect time to remind you, um, if you have the capabilities on the platform that you're listening to, please give us a rating, please drop us a comment, and if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. We're still looking to get to 100,000 subscribers soon, and, um, I guess we'll bring up, we'll bring them on, um, you know, in 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 an, an episode uh, soon enough. But we do have someone new here at PCA headquarters that you'll start seeing some uh, some more um, more footage, more content, and more bang sort of in social media. Yeah, if you when you're listening, or I should say, watching this on YouTube on Monday, if that's how you consume podcasts um any of the reels you saw on instagram and uh our facebook page for moonstock that that is the work now of uh, bugdon roberson mm-hmm. who is our social media specialist 24 he's, years old yeah yeah he's very good at what he does yep yep so it'll be a lot of fun having someone focused on that in addition mm-hmm. to what we normally do and we're just bringing you more for your PCA membership. So the next podcast, uh, we'll be discussing Unstock because we'll be uh, mm-hmm. recording it, uh, I think, the Monday right after Unstock, And then the one after that, we'll be talking about the LA Auto Show, and I've asked Anthony, our uh, member services uh, rep, and he's going to uh, tell us about his first driver's ed. Oh. Yeah, he did it. Uh, even with Connor as an instructor, he had a good time. <laughs> even. <laughs> I'm sure Connor is a great as an instructor. <laughs> he uh, he's already asking a lot of questions about upgrading his car and oh uh, boy, he only did a one day event, so he's uh, yeah. as we 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 imagine he's very much hooked about on the. Yeah. Uh, and I want him to, what I want him to talk about is, and I haven't asked him, and I'm going to wait till the podcast is um, how he felt his uh, sim because he's very good at sim racing. He races in the PCA series since 
has uh, I think he's won a couple of races. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He always places high up. Uh, ask him how um, sim racing uh, helped him. Was there uh, an advantage um, to driving the track prior? Which I, I can't imagine there wasn't. At least, like I told him, at the very least, knowing no left where, or right where yeah, you're going, where to turn, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, what he felt uh, the difference was actually driving a car on the track versus sim racing. All right. So uh, a few um, updates on events. Uh, we did mention that Tech Tactics West is canceled. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't have a home uh, to be able to conduct it this fall. But we'll be back. We'll be back for Tech Tactics East. And, of course, we will shoot for having Tech Tactics West again next year. As we mentioned earlier, Unstock is happening uh, this Sunday. Or by the time you re- uh, listen to this, it will have been last Sunday. Uh, looking forward to letting you know how that all turned out. Same thing, um, the LA Auto Show member preview is sold out, but we'll be reporting back to you on everything that went down there. And um, I think, gentlemen, that's all that we have for this yep. week. Yep. And uh, thanks for listening. If you aren't currently a PCA member and you own a Porsche, grab that VIN and go to PCA.org. We'd love to have you on board as a member. And for those of you that are looking for a Porsche, check out our test drive program. Remember to follow our podcast Instagram page, just uh, Porsche Club Insider, all one word. You can send us a message via email as well at podcast at PCA.org. And of course, be sure to remember to like, subscribe, drop us a comment, give us a solid rating. We love seeing your feedback uh, on all the different platforms. Until next time, stay safe and we'll catch you down the road.